As you know, Millward Brown pre-tests a, a lot of TV commercials for clients around the world, and essentially we cross-referenced our database with ads that were available on YouTube and simply cross-reference the number of weekly views that these ads achieved on YouTube against our link pretesting database. And what we found was that we could predict with a reasonable degree of accuracy the sort of creative potential of those executions. Um, some very familiar metrics in there. So for instance, Millward Brown's Awareness Index, which uh, predicts how well an ad's going to be remembered on television, uh, had a correlation with YouTube viewings. But in addition to that, there were some other metrics that were important as well. Perhaps not surprisingly, the degree to which people um, were willing to say that this was a video that they want to pass on to others was important. Uh, whether or not there was a celebrity in the ad and how, how much star power the celebrity had was also important. And then last but certainly not least, how distinctive the video was came through as an important factor for driving viewing. And I think that's an interesting point because it's essentially saying it, online there has to be a promise that the viewing experience is worthwhile, that it's going to be unique and different in some way. Otherwise, why on earth would someone spend their time viewing it? And in that regard, perhaps the, the bar for advertisers in a, an online or viral context is much higher than it is on regular television where you're essentially paying to put the ad in front of someone. Now you've actually got to make people want to watch it and that's a, an even bigger challenge. If you can get those bonus views because the audience has now become your media channel and they're forwarding the ad on to other people then obviously that's a good thing but you know if you're an advertiser what you really want is someone who sees your video it, ha it leaves an impression on them in some way and certainly you want it to actually influence their behavior in some way so you could argue that those are two slightly different things that merely getting people to view the ads in the first place in the online environment is a good thing and then if they pass it on as well that's the bonus and I think one of the things that I'll be talking about tomorrow uh, is the fact that it's not just how creative the execution is that matters, it's also how well you seed it. So in other words, because you're dealing with this vast conglomeration of individual people's networks, somehow you need to get enough people to see your video in the first place that they will then start to pass it on in enough um, quantity that it's really going to give you that bonus viewing that you're looking for. Once you've got something that you're pretty sure is going to resonate with your target audience, of course the challenge is then where do you find your target audience? And that's the mission critical part about this is identifying, not just putting the video up on a dedicated website, not just putting it on Facebook, because yeah, Facebook reaches an awful lot of people, but typically most people belong to one social network for sort of social stuff, they may also belong to something that's more business oriented. But if you really want things to travel, you're going to have to be on Facebook and MySpace and Bebo and so on in order to make sure that you're present. And there are lots of things that we've discovered simply in the process of doing the research. Sometimes the naming strategy is mission critical because when someone goes in and you know, searches for Coke ad, there may be, you know, there's going to be hundreds of them. So how do they track down the one that their friend told them about, but they didn't send them the link? So there are lots of different things that advertisers need to think about. It's not as simple as buying your airtime. You've got to be in the right place. You've got to be easily findable. And then you've got to make it easy to pass on. We have not done, it, done any studies on that explicitly um, that I'm aware of. Um, I think I can speak from personal experience that there's a value when someone passes a, 
a video onto me, then it has a certain amount of their, they're putting, you know, their reputation on the line for sending me good stuff. But it also comes as a sort of warranty that says this is worth my time and attention. Whereas if something pops up in the, the side of the, the screen, it's like that's more an annoyance than it is uh, something that I really want to look at. Um, I visit the BBC website quite a lot and there is a particularly annoying video that starts playing with me having little control over it, I've now had to stop that thing playing five times and I really don't want to hear what they've got to say to me. And I think advertisers really do need to more, be more sensitive about the viewing context than certainly seems to be apparent right now. I think the funny thing to me is, you know, everybody talked about the, or is talking about the need to engage people and yet here we have online an environment where you really ought to be able to engage people, to actually um, give them extended content, actually converse with them online, and what do we do? We, we interrupt them, just as you know, we're supposedly doing with TV. I think the, the interesting thing is that everybody tends to forget that we're dealing with different environments. TV is passive, not everybody has a DVR, not everybody wants to control what they're viewing every second. And so if you put an execution on TV, then there's a likelihood that a reasonable number of people will actually watch it with some attention. Whereas in the online environment, people are in control actively and pretty much all the time. And they're looking for the stuff that interests them. And if you're interrupting what they want to do, that's a negative. And so I think those are dynamics that people really need to think more about because, yeah, having sound come on and video start playing of its own accord can be pretty disruptive. I think the interesting thing is, um, I, I'll just extrapolate from the work that we've done with regular TV and with the, the viral viewing, that the interesting thing is this whole role of distinctiveness in the online environment, that there needs to be that promise that this is going to be worth your while to watch because you are in control of the medium and it's your choice. Whereas with TV, you know, many people it's sort of, okay, I've taken my brain out at the end of the day, put it in my bowl of warm water and I'm just going to watch what comes along. Um, and that's a whole different set of requirements. Um, so I think the real challenge though is to keep in mind that the search for distinctiveness, the search for that uniqueness and that slightly edgy, gripping quality that will mean that people will be willing to forward things on, needs to keep in mind the fact, why are we doing this? We're doing this to make some impression about the brand. So subsequent to the uh, research that my colleagues did last year, we recently tested eight videos that have gone viral in the US, one of which was the Coke vending machine ad. And I think that is a classic example of an execution where the brand is central to what's going on, but it's still an eminently watchable piece of film. I mean, I can't watch it without smiling because you see these college kids pulling stuff out of the machine, you know, the hand comes out with a pizza box. It's just, it's a lovely piece of film. Now, the interesting thing is that you might not want to send that to your cool friends you might actually send it to your mum or to other members of your family. Whereas one of the other executions we tested was the, um, the Old Spice, uh, the man your man could smell like, which was actually very interesting because that engaged both women and men, although they found different things to be of interest about the execution. Um, that one I suspect would get passed on in a different fashion and some people might feel a little uncomfortable about passing that one on. Um, then of course there are other ones. Uh, we tested an ad for uh, Carl's Jr. with Kim Kardashian in and guess what? Guys loved it and they were willing to pass it on to other guys. Women didn't enjoy it. So that's one of the key things that you also have to think about is very much which target are you aiming at and who are you trying to influence in terms of passing something on? In that regard, um, 
you know, the, the viewers of these things are, are self-selective. You, you've talked about kind of the need, you know, with so much out there, it's a need to do something that uh, grabs the attention of, of viewers and then potential viewers. Um, so what a difference between, say, television advertising and online advertising in the video space be one where the, the online should be even more targeted, a little bit edgier, have a little bit more risk to say, okay, we're willing to alienate a couple of people here in order to drive loyalty within a certain demographic that we're trying to reach? And is there a balance? I, I think that's a really interesting question because yes, if you want something to travel, then the more tightly you can target it at a group of people who are gonna share common interests um, the more and the edgier and you know the more gripping it is, the more sexy it is in some cases. Then yeah, people are going to be more willing to pass it on. But equally, it's got to fit with what your brand stands for. You know, going back to the Old Spice example and the Coke example, the the Old Spice execution is appropriate to that brand, I would suggest, whereas it would be totally inappropriate for Coke whereas the vending machine execution is totally appropriate to the positioning that Coca-Cola is trying to, to maintain. The key things I'm going to be focusing on are, you know, the title says it all. New media, old rules. And, you know, rule number one is that creativity rules. You have to have something compelling that people will want to watch. But rule number two is that reach counts. Um, there seems to be, an, there's an interesting belief that something that sort of percolates slowly through the, the social media world is going to be more powerful and more value, more valuable than something that reaches a lot of people quickly. And I'm not sure that that's proven. One of the really interesting things about the research we've just done, and I'm going to go back to the Coca-Cola vending machine ad and the Old Spice ad, the Old Spice ad was shown on television. Now, in actual fact, according to our creative potential measures, the Coca-Cola ad may actually have more viral potential than the Old Spice execution. But guess what? Old Spice has five times the weekly viewing rate. The reason? More people have been exposed to it. And they're willing to go look at it again, and they're willing to pass it on to other people. The Coke ad has been spread virally through Facebook, through Twitter, and, uh, and other places, but it's not getting that critical mass, which means that it transcends all the individual networks that exist out there. So there are going to be many people out there who've never even heard of it. So I think that's a really interesting dimension where you start going, you know what, yes, this is a new media, but there are still some basic principles we have to think about and one is, can I actually get this in front of people? And because if people don't see it, then it's not going to have any effect. So in, ter in terms of reach, would you say that a, a good strategy or a possible strategy or a strategy to consider would be one where you get the reach, say, through television and do maybe variations on a theme? So you do your one television play that can blanket an audience that's of interest right. enough that they're going to go search for it and they say, oh wow, there are these three or four, it's kind of almost a little series, or three Absolutely. or four others. I mean, to my mind, one of the biggest challenges about uh, viral video is campaignability. I mean, there are, there are some that manage it, but often executions are one-off. You know, take the, the Cadbury Dairy Milk Gorilla, um, which was a massive hit. But then it took a while before Cadbury then, the Fallon came up with the execution, the eyebrow ad, which again was another big hit. And there was actually an execution in between, which was far less of a, a hit. It's very difficult to come up with something that's campaignable. But if you've got something that's great, then if you can actually seed it on TV to get, pique people's interest, to get them to go online, you can have extended content online. And let's not just focus on TV, because it could just be you've got a great PR campaign around your piece of video that's, you know, that's going to drive people to go look at it. It could equally well be it ties through to print advertising. Um, I think the critical thing is that people, it needs to get to people's attention, 
so that they then are willing, it has the promise that it's worth going to look at, it's worth engaging with further. And if you simply sort of post and hope, then like as not your, ex, you know, your video is not going to get that much viewing. I think there's probably not that many things to think about. Number one, what does your brand stand for? Because whatever you do has got to be consonant, it's got to fit with that positioning. It might stretch it, but it can't go too far, otherwise people will, will reject it and lose track of it. And I think that one of the things, again, things that people lose sight of is in the online environment, there are some brands which people are attracted to, that they're interested in, and they're willing to hear from. Um, so what's your brand going to bring to the party that makes it new, different, and distinctive? And it should be consistent with what the brand actually stands for. And, you know, it's like, do you have something that's worth saying? Is it something that's going to be distinctive? Is it something that's going to be interesting? Is it something that's going to be unique? Because if it is, then you've got something that's got the potential to travel. Um, next thing is obviously, you know, how's the target audience going to be reached? How are you actually going to get that execution in front of them? I think that I continue to get the impression that we're desperately seeking for new methodologies um, to old problems. And I thought there was a great presentation this morning that talked about um, rules of engagement, if you like, how to, should we be bringing people closer together in terms of what does the research mean? How do we communicate it? Would you rather have something that's inaccurate but quick? Would you rather have it these are the debates we need to have. Um, things like biometrics, neuroscience, add to our understanding. Um, they certainly get at implicit communication and sort of precognitive reactions, and that adds to our understanding and of how things work. But I'm not sure that it's really addressing the key issue for market research today, which is how do we get what we do already used how can we make actionable recommendations and communicate them simply, even though you know, what, what's behind them may be very complex.